to turn from evil, to live beyond our losses. In humility and faith, therefore, let us confess our sins using the prayer of confession that is printed in the bulletin, followed by a moment of silent confession. Let us pray. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses, and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, we pray. Amen. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives us all our sins strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep us in eternal life. Amen. Today to celebrate the sacrament of Christian baptism, uh, Tom and Kylan Anderson are presenting their infant daughter Elizabeth for the sacrament, and Henry McFadden will be the elder representative taking part in this uh, baptism. Now I understand that some of the family members are down here on the first pew. We're glad to have you here, and I know this is a very special occasion, not only for Tom and Kylan and Ellen and Elizabeth, but also for the entire family. Welcome to, to this church. Tom and Kylan, the sacrament of baptism is of divine ordinance. God our Father, who is also the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, has redeemed us by the sacrifice of our Lord. They belong, the children belong with us who believe to the membership of the church through the covenant that was made in Christ and which is confirmed to us by God in this sacrament, which is a sign and seal of our cleansing from sin, of our being united with the Lord Jesus Christ, and of our welcome into the family of God. Our Savior said, Suffer the little children to come to me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. In presenting your child, Elizabeth Kingsbury Anderson, for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ, and you show that you want your child to study him, know him, love him, and serve him as his chosen disciple. Show your purpose by answering these questions. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Do you trust in him? I do. Do you intend your child to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? Our Lord Jesus ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of the church, promise to tell this new disciple, Elizabeth Kingsbury Anderson, the good news of the gospel, to help her know all that Jesus commands, and, by your fellowship, to strengthen her family ties with the household of God? The congregation will respond by saying, we do. We do. Let us unite in prayer. Our most loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Church of Jesus Christ, the ministry of your word, and the sacraments of grace. We're grateful that you have called not only us, but also our children to be included in the family of God, marking them with this sacrament as a singular token and pledge of your love. Set apart now this water from its common to a sacred use, and grant that what we now do on earth may be confirmed eternally in heaven. As in humble faith, we present Elizabeth Kingsbury to you. We ask you to receive her, to endue her with your Holy Spirit, 
and to keep her as your own. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. What is the full Christian name of your child? Elizabeth Kingsbury Anderson. Elizabeth Kingsbury Anderson, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and abide with you forever. It's time now to present her to the congregation and see if she's going to make this transition well. And she is looking at everybody in the congregation, isn't she? She is an alert young lady. Elizabeth, it's a real privilege and honor for me to present you to this group of people because they are your new family in the church. You belong with all of us here to the family of God. And these folks with the smiles on their faces are greeting you and welcoming you to be one of the very special people, one of the very special members of this congregation of God's people. We love you. God loves you. He's going to be with you as you grow and develop. And as you become a young lady, and one day you'll stand before this church or a church somewhere and make a profession that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Welcome into the family of God. Elizabeth Kingsbury Anderson is now received into Christ's church, and you, the people of this church, have promised with God's help to be her sponsor to the end that she may indeed confess Jesus Christ as her Savior. Our Lord said, Whoever receives one such little child in my name receives me. Let us pray. Our Father, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us together in the body of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for choosing to add to our number this little daughter in the faith. Together may we live in love so as to encourage and nurture her as she grows, that we all together may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. It's our custom to welcome our newest member by singing, Jesus Loves Me. Let's stand and join together in the singing of that hymn. I'd like to take this opportunity to extend a warm and cordial welcome to all who are worshiping in this sanctuary today. If you are a visitor in our congregation, we're glad that you're here. We want you to know that the doors of this church are always open to you, and all of its activities, uh, worship and study and service, are activities that we would welcome you to be a part of. If you are looking for a church home in the Raleigh area, uh, please consider the possibility of becoming one of us here at First Presbyterian and serving Christ through this fellowship of believers. There will be an elder in this room, the session room, 
after the service today to answer your questions or to explain to you the procedures for church membership if you are interested in, in making that kind of commitment at this time. We always ask our worshipers, our members and visitors alike to participate in the ritual of friendship. There's a pad at the aisle end of your pew and if you would take that and sign your name and give us the other bits of information requested there and then leave it open and pass it back down the pew everyone will have the opportunity to be familiar with, with all the worshipers on their particular pew. We have another technique for helping those to know the visitors behind and in front of them, and that is if you look in front of you, you will see a card with a red ribbon on it. And if you are so inclined, pin that red ribbon on your lapel, and it will help our church members to identify you as a visitor and thereby give them the opportunity to greet you in the appropriate way. If you are a visitor, we hope you'll come back and, and worship with us on a regular basis. After <clears throat> the service today, there will be a time of fellowship and coffee in the Balkum Parlor, which is to my right in the back of the sanctuary across the hall. And if you will come there for a brief time, we would be glad to chat with you and answer questions, and just get to know each other in a better way. We're glad all of you are here today. May God bless us and speak to us as we worship him. Let us continue our worship now as we sing together hymn number 119, The Strife is O'er. seating. Our Old Testament lesson is from Psalm 16, verses 5 through 11. Hear now the word of God. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel, and the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. 
for you do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We continue with our scripture lesson, reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad, then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now dear, nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of God for the people of God Amen. We continue now the reading of the Word of God as we turn to our epistle lesson, which is taken from the first letter of Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Hear the Word of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, which though perishable is tested by fire, may redound to praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Without having seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with an unutterable and exalted joy as the outcome of your faith you obtain the salvation of your souls. May God bless to our understanding and to our deepening spiritual enrichment 
this reading of his holy word. Let us again look to God in a brief moment of prayer. <clears throat> o Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and redeemer, in Christ's name, amen. According to that gospel account that was just read from Luke chapter 24, it was a gloomy pair who trudged that seven or eight miles from Jerusalem to that suburban little town of Emmaus late that evening on the first day of the week. We were able, certainly if we had been there, to see the despair in their drawn faces, to detect it in their dragging feet, to hear it in their muted voices. They spoke to one another in hushed and sad tones, and so absorbed were they in their grief that they did not even notice that stranger who came up from behind and fell into step with them as they walked. You two look very sad, he said. What are you talking about, which is so distressing? In astonishment, they turned to speak to the stranger. Why, you must be the only person in all Jerusalem who does not know those things which have occurred there in recent days. What things, he asks. Why, all about Jesus of Nazareth, that great, mighty prophet of God. They have crucified him. And he is the one, they said, that we had hoped would be the Messiah to set Israel free. We had hoped, they said, and what a sad phrase that turned out to be. They had hoped, but now their dreams were dead, buried with the body of Jesus in a sealed tomb. We had hoped, but now their aspirations had to be put into the past tense, and their future looked bleak indeed. But you know, it just may be that such discouraging words may find an echo in some of our sad hearts here this morning, for surely there is someone here in this sanctuary this morning who may be traveling something of a modern-day Emmaus Road. Life may have dealt you a bad hand, and you too may have looked back upon some crushing event in your life which seemed to stop you cold on the upward way, and you have wistfully said, I had hope. Maybe yours was a hope for love. You can certainly recall the day that you fell in love, that day when your wedding was taking place, when the first baby was born, and when you moved into that shiny new home. Ours is a perfect love, you said to yourself and to your mate. But somehow, over time, things began to change. And today, you may just find yourself in a very different kind of circumstance, separated or divorced or even widowed. Somehow things have changed and, and you're just dealing, some of you, with a shell of a marriage as it used to be. Your hopes have faded and you are wondering if that love, which once was a sheer delight, could ever possibly be rekindled in your life. Now perhaps yours was a hope for success and happiness. One time you dreamed of mountains that you were going to climb, seas that you planned to, planned to sail. Uh, you had a glowing vision of squeezing the last drop of happiness out of life, but over the years that dream seems to have passed you by. And today you might be telling yourself in despair that for you the best seems to be past and perhaps even the worst is yet to come. Or maybe yours was an aspiration toward character. Once you cherished a positive vision of yourself as a person strong and high-minded and, dev and devoted, but somehow along the way you failed yourself and you let yourself down, you remember things that you have done, things that you have been, that even today bring you shame and sorrow, and now you feebly admit, well, I am what I am. And I just don't know whether I would be able to change. Well, if your life has been touched in any way by that kind of discouragement, then I would encourage you to go back with me to that Emmaus Road of long ago. Those two despairing disciples and their stranger along the way stopped to eat a meal. 
And as that stranger broke the bread, a miracle occurred. We are told that the eyes of these despairing disciples were open, and suddenly they saw that the stranger there was none other than Jesus himself. Their Lord was risen. He was not dead as they had feared. They knew now that truly he was alive. At the moment that earth-shattering fact dawned down upon the souls of these two despairing men, their whole affect was radically changed. Their hope, which had been buried with Jesus, was now resurrected. Now there was a spring in their step, a song in their heart, and their lips were set on fire to tell the amazing story that Jesus Christ is risen. He is alive, for we have seen him. We know the reality that Jesus Christ lives, and because of it, we possess a living hope. But let the Apostle Peter, who was writing in our second Bible text from his epistle near the end of the New Testament, be the spokesman for all those early Christian believers whose lives were so strongly impacted by the risen Christ. Thirty years later, he wrote a letter to some Christians who were living under a gathering storm of persecution. Some of them were being imprisoned. Some were being thrown out into the stadiums where they would have to do battle for their life with wild animals. Some were being crucified because of their allegiance to Jesus Christ. And yet, despite such ominous prospects, you cannot help but catch the air of confidence in Peter's voice. Thirty years later, he is still living under the spine-tingling exhilaration of having met the risen Christ. And therefore, he cries out in the words of this passage, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. In other words, the Apostle Peter is saying that this was not just a resurrection for Jesus Christ. It was a resurrection to new life for all of us too. As St. Clement of Alexandria was to express it some years later, he has turned all of our sunsets into sunrise. But here we are at the close of the 20th century. The world is very different today than it was back in the first century AD. And so you might feel like asking, but how can this resurrection of Jesus Christ almost 2,000 years ago still be a resurrection to new life for you and me today? How can that blessed hope about which Peter wrote and about which these these disciples had experienced its reality, how can it come to us and impact us in the here and now? Well, I think the very first step to that is to admit that you would like to believe like that. You would like to believe like that despite your doubts and discouragements, your sins and your failures, your uncertainties and your fears. Now, of course, we're all abundantly aware that we're living in a very cynical and skeptical age. In just the last week or so, all the three major news magazines published in this country, Time and Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report, published cover articles, feature articles about Jesus Christ. But if you read these articles, you will see that they mainly explained how contemporary scholars, many of them secular scholars, are trying to rewrite the story of Jesus after their own preconceptions. They generally discredit a great deal of the gospel accounts about the life of Jesus, and they flatly deny most of them that Jesus ever rose from the grave. And some of these so-called scholars have even taken part in what I consider to be an intellectually questionable activity called that Jesus Seminar, where they gather once a year and determine by, by majority vote which of the words of Jesus recorded in the Gospels might be, in their judgment, authentic words of our Lord. So you see, our world is challenging our faith. 
People are asking us, by what right do you Christians say that Jesus Christ rose from the grave, that he is your friend, and that he cares for you? For all you know, they say he just may be a figment of your imagination, a psychological projection, a self-made image to soothe your aches and to calm your fears. How in the world then can we have that same kind of living hope in resurrection as expressed by the Apostle Peter in our text? Well, the philosopher Unamuno once said, to believe in God is, in the first instance, a wish that there may be a God and to be unable to live without him. Now, what do you do when a sense of physical hunger sweeps over you? Why, well, you go out in search of food to satisfy that hunger. And what do you do when you sense down deep inside a need for love and friendship? Well, you go out and find a relationship which will meet those needs for friendship and love. And likewise, when we feel inside an intensely felt hunger for a relationship for the living God, it makes sense to seek a relationship by admitting that our hearts are restless and they will always be restless until they find their rest in God. In other words, we all have to make a decision. We have to decide about which course of faith and life we're going to take. We can decide to put our faith in God through the risen Lord Jesus Christ, or we can simply decide, on the other hand, to go it on our own. Now, I realize that there are countless thousands of people out in the world making no pretense whatsoever of Christian commitment, and they seem to do all right, at least for a time. Sometimes it's possible for people to continue to go for a long time on what they had in the past, or what other people have, or what society and tradition has to offer. And such a parasitic existence can last for a long time. But how often at the end of that road there lies restlessness and defeat and despair and sometimes a kind of a, a breakdown. But if we ever expect to exist under the dynamic of a living resurrection hope, we've got to realize that life is incomplete without a relationship to the living God. We've got to understand that faith is better than no faith and that we must decide that we will refuse to exist without the increased meaning and joy in living which comes only when we put our hope in the living Christ. The next step to find that dynamic of living and resurrection hope is to go and to get connected where that hope is. If you want to raise a garden, you don't go up to some frozen Arctic region to do it, but you find a fertile area where the climate is suitable. If you need a good education, you don't sit at home and do nothing. It's best if you matriculate in a good school or college. Now, I realize that many people seem to find faith on their own through a personal spiritual search of reflection and meditation and prayer and study of the Bible. But you know, this is the exception rather than the rule. The much more natural process is to go where people already possess that vital Christian hope, to relate to them and to inquire how they got it. And of course, this is where the Christian church comes in. The church is meant by God to be the organ by which the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is to be made available to all humanity. It is intended to be the place where God's people are living in hope, where they are believing in hope, and where they are channels through which God's hope can flow constantly out toward our world. But of course, this brings us to the reality that the church in her present condition is beset by all sorts of weaknesses and human failures and defects. In fact, old Martin Luther, the reformer, once likened the church to Noah's Ark filled with animals. He said that he wouldn't be able to stand the stench on the inside if it weren't for the storm and the flood raging on the outside. 
And likewise, many of us may feel a frustration toward some of the imperfections and the inadequacies inadequacies that we see in ourselves as church people and others and in our church organizations. But despite all of that, I'm convinced that there is probably more true Christian hope, more genuine faith and love within the church than we sometimes realize. Yet Christ gets through to people more surely than we might often suppose. And even when in the church our commitment is defective and half-hearted, when our programs are dry and sterile, when our organization is wooden and hidebound, when our sermons sometimes are dull and irrelevant, there are still those little circles of genuine Christian fellowship, those one-on-one faith-sharing relationships, those tiny little groups of people who get together to study and pray and to support one another in Christian hope and love, those small unheralded service and mission endeavors which reach out in love to the world. You see, real faith is being nurtured and the flame of genuine hope is still being kindled in the church, sometimes more than we even realize. And Christian fellowship in this most basic grassroots level is often the most effective way for us to come to a strengthened belief in Christian faith and hope. For when a piece of dry wood is placed in contact with a live coal, ignition will result. And likewise, when a seeking person, a searching person, a person who wants to have a deeper faith, comes into contact with people who live in a warm and vital resurrection hope, and can give good evidence for that hope because of the experience of the life that they live, that searcher, that seeker, coming into contact with them will find their Christian hope and faith and love to be very contagious. So if you have a hunger in your life to experience more of this Christian hope and to develop a stronger faith, if you want to know your Lord in a more real and relevant way for your daily living, then I would suggest that you search out and get to know some other persons who are already to some dimension reflecting that quality of living, or at least get together with a fellow group of seekers who will work with you and strive with you toward a common goal of spiritual growth. You may be surprised and pleased to discover that your faith will flourish as a result of that. And finally, the power of living hope can be released into our lives if we are willing to attempt a personal experiment of faith. Many people in the church, I'm afraid, have gotten the wrong idea about what it means to be a Christian because they've so often been misled by what we preachers typically say from the pulpit. They come to church seeking a word of hope and faith and forgiveness and the prospect of a new life in Jesus Christ. But so often from the pulpits, we preachers lay upon them all sorts of legalistic exhortations, such as be holy, be strong, be good, be pure, be godly. And we call our congregations to demonstrate great levels of commitment and to be involved in unstinting efforts at all sorts of good works and mission and ministry. Now, certainly, these ideals are important, but is that all that Jesus Christ has to offer despairing, discouraged people, a set of impossible ideals, a code of laws, a long list of rules and regulations? Well, according to St. Peter in our biblical text today, the answer is a resounding no. Rather, he says, your faith and hope is not based upon what you do, or some status that you earn with God by your own effort, but it's based upon what God has done for you in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. He writes, you are guarded by the power of God through faith unto a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. So you see, this is what God offers in Christ. Not rules, but release. Not laws, but a new life. Not good advice, but good news. Not a new leaf, but a new birth. Not our faltering weakness, but his resurrection power. 
as Peter says, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And this experiment of faith begins when we start living daily in fellowship with God's people and also in close fellowship with our living Lord Jesus Christ. It involves talking to Him in prayer, in our minds, about every circumstance and, and need of our life. It involves being honest with Him about our sins and failures, our doubts and fears. It means asking Him to guide us as we seek to work out some of the problems in our life, the naughty ones as well as the easy ones. And St. Peter tells us very realistically that this lifestyle may not be easy because we may have to suffer various trials. But this is good, he says, because those trials prove the genuineness of our faith and prepare us to receive even greater blessings. So in summation, this experiment of faith means reaching out to Jesus Christ in every way that is available to us. And he promises as the living Lord that he will make himself known to us. R.S. Bushnell, who lived more than a hundred years ago when he was a young man, doubted that God even existed, but he wanted to know for sure. And so he tried a personal experiment of faith. He studied the Bible. He studied theology. He talked with, with other people about their faith. He tried to glean from them what it was all about. And then he says he prayed to the dim God confessing the dimness for honesty's sake. And says Bushnell, after that long, intricate experiment of faith, that searching quest upon which he was, uh, was a journeying, he said that he arose from his knees confessing, a being so profoundly felt must be inevitably believed. Bushnell became, of course, as many of you know, a great Christian believer and a great minister of the Christian gospel. And may God help us in a similar experiment of faith that we may be able to express a newfound sense of living hope, of living faith in a risen Lord Jesus Christ. And that we might, as a congregation of God's people here at First Presbyterian, be able to testify with the apostle Without having seen him, I love him. And though I do not now see him, I believe in him and rejoice with unutterable and exalted joy. May it be so for all of us. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith saying together the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 14 in the hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, life everlasting. Amen. Let us now look to God in prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, all about us, new life is bursting forth, reminding us of your power in creating our world 
and your continued power in renewing it with beauty and life. We do rejoice in the world about us, thanking you for the gifts of spring, for daffodils blowing in the wind, for the pure white beauty of dogwoods, for cleansing rains that water the thirsty soil, for sunshine peeping through the clouds. Each day we enjoy the gifts of your world. Help us to remember that we are also charged to care for it. Remind us to use our fair share of resources and to guard your world for future generations to come. Loving God, with new life springing forth around us, we are reminded of the fragile quality of life, that each day lives are lost to senseless violence and reckless accidents. Be with families who struggle to find meaning in the midst of tragedy and loss. Help us all to work for a world that is a safer and happier place for all people. Caring God, we know that with the gift of life also comes the potential for pain, and there are so many hurting people in our world. We pray especially for families struggling economically to make ends meet. We pray for those where angry words are heard more often than the words, I love you. We pray for those struggling with domestic violence and abusive, destructive relationships that limit the potential for normal growth. We pray for the pain that others feel, pain often that goes unexpressed, that builds into anger and turns hearts into stone. Loving God, we know that your love as the great physician offers healing to a world wrecked with pain. Guide politicians and leaders to work for peace. Break down the walls of racial, ethnic, and religious prejudice. Move nations and peoples to work for economic, social, and political reform. Help us to realize that each day, each and every one of us has an opportunity to make a difference in the world about us. Great God, may your healing touch bring comfort and hope to those who are suffering from illness, to those who face hospitalization, surgery, and test who struggle to accept news that is not easy to take, who face the anxieties and uncertainties of the future, whose lives seem hopeless and filled with despair. Be also with those who have lost loved ones, those who face the loneliness of lives separated by death, divorce, or splintered relationships. Reach out to those in pain of any kind that they might feel the comfort of your healing presence. God of hope, Touch the lives of all of us, for each of us have wounds that need healing. Each of us face problems that need solving. Each of us needs guidance facing the challenges that life brings. Help us to center our lives in you, realizing that in you we live and move and have our being. From you comes the strength we need to live life to its fullest, finding depth, meaning, and purpose. From you also we can gain courage, courage to reach out to others, to build bridges, and to ask forgiveness. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, who is our living hope, and who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, and to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The God of hope has blessed us and called us to be a community that brings hope into the lives of others. We can do this by sharing our gifts, our talents, and our time and our material resources with others. Let us rejoice then in what we have been given and what we can give as we receive our morning offering.
Let us pray. Gracious God, bless our offerings that they may reach out and touch the lives of those who hunger, who hurt, and who seek new hope. Use us and our gifts to your honor and glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 341, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. As you go forth from this place today, remember that admonition of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be not faithless, but believing. Remember that you have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so go forth to believe in that hope, to live that hope, and to share that hope with all you meet. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and abide with you forever. Amen.